Welcome back to the GSMC Sports Podcast. We went a little long on that last segment. So for this next one, we're going to try and, you know, go through it a little bit faster, but obviously still take up the 15-minute block that we typically do here. This segment, we're going to be evaluating the 2023 NBA Draft rookies up to this point in the season. So again, we're going to move through these a little bit quicker than we did those last ones. Starting off, Victor Wembanyama, he is just about everything that has he's lived up to just about all the hype you could have asked for in terms of his rookie season. I think that at this point, he's kind of running away with the Rookie of the Year award. Obviously, now we're getting into the discussions. A lot of people are projecting, well, what's this going to look like going forward? He's been called the top 20 player in the league this year. I don't know if I'm willing to go that far yet. I mean, the defensive impact that he has really is tremendous. You see the flashes on offense. Interestingly enough, he's shooting significantly better off the dribble than he is in catch and shoot situations. You think that that is something that he can definitely end up refining and being that much more dangerous. We've seen the handles that he had coming into the season and it hasn't looked necessarily the smoothest at all times, specifically earlier in the year when he was making that adjustment. It wasn't the best. I don't know that he needs to really be as much of a dribbling through traffic guy like it's definitely a very strong benefit to be able to have a guy that can grab the rebound on the defensive end after making probably a defensive play and then take the ball up the court himself he is a threat to pull up in transition but I don't know how much we need to really see him driving downhill like that now again if he wants to do that and he can do that successfully all power to him i'm very excited to see what the finished product of Wembenyama is but i think that operating more out of sort of the post-ups and that i mean really at all levels i think that my point is here i just don't think that he needs to do as much of the dribble creation himself which also speaks to the san antonio spurs where We've talked about them a couple times now. They need to do a better job of putting floor generals on the court with him to be able to initiate some of the actual offense. Jeremy Sohan, in my last uh, exercise, I had him as a slight stock down. I've never been the biggest Jeremy Sohan guy. I just think that he does a lot, and they enable him to do a lot, and there is something there that he's sort of scratching at, but I feel like he sort of gets in the way a little bit of Wemby's progression here. And I mean, nothing's stopping Wemby from being the player that he is sort of showing us that he definitely could be as the years come. But I think that if anything was going to, it's going to be what the Spurs put around him. So I have been all in on Wemby and it's been a lot of fun. Number two pick, Brandon Miller. Brandon Miller, I've given him some love on the show before. I feel like it's flying very under the radar in terms of the type of season that he has. We're seeing the maturity on both ends. And it's not just the ability to play defense, but his desire to really want to and to have his teammates playing as well. Like he's getting in the grills of his teammates that aren't running back on defense. And he is locked in on both sides. I think that... I mean, really, if you look back to his freshman season in Alabama, when all of the drama was going around about when he was somehow connected to this gun charge that went on with somebody else at the school, he played a game against South Carolina where they were chanting lock him up all throughout the game, and he put on one of the best performances of his freshman season scoring wise i think that he's just one of those guys we've seen him in that moment we've seen him this year i really do think that he's wired different differently and i was more so on the scoot henderson who we're going to get to in a minute i was more so on the scoot henderson train coming into this draft class i thought that once again sort of like i talked about with the last one i thought that the Hornets were making a little bit of a mistake drafting more so for fit 
than for the best player available. But Brandon Miller has definitely proven me wrong. I've had a lot of fun watching him this year, and I think that he's going to continue to get better. On that note, Scoot Henderson definitely had a rough start to the season, dealt with some injuries early on that held him back, and the efficiency has not been great for him this year. But I think that if you look at sort of the past few draft classes and the way that we've seen some of these guys like Luka, like Trey Young come out, and I mean, Trey even struggled early on as well, but I feel like we forget how historically it takes a couple years maybe even for these young guards to develop. And Scoot Henderson, he hit some bumps early in his career, but I think that he has been really impressive since then. If you look back to the start of 2024, coming into this new calendar year, his career high in assists was seven. He has now eclipsed that mark on three, seven different times, getting up to 11 in a couple games, 10 in a couple games, and a few nine assist marks. I think that we're seeing him definitely mature as a floor general. The game is starting to slow down for him. His decision making is getting better over time, which is something that I think is a really positive sign because Scoot is somebody who the offensive, the floor for him is there just based off of how athletic he is. I think that he reminds me a lot of Russell Westbrook. It's just a matter of sort of nailing down that efficiency and being able to score from outside. The efficiency still is down right now. He's shooting 38-31 splits, but again, I think that he, if you watch him throughout the course of the year, you are seeing him be able to take some necessary steps in the developmental path. Moving forward, I'm putting these guys together for a handful of different reasons. Amen and Osar Thompson, evaluating them together because they look and they play identical. Their profiles are very similar up to this point. A little unfair, maybe, but it honestly is uncanny how similar their seasons have gone for their rookie years. They are both horrendous perimeter shooters. So much so that StatMuse had this. They are the two lowest three-point percentage shooters on one or more attempts per game. Asar Thompson is shooting 15.5% from three. Amen is shooting 15.8. They're both all right from mid-range, shooting around 40%, but that was their thing coming into the league was their perimeter shooting and it has been pretty abysmal so far up to this point. Amen has been showing a little more flashes as of late. Scored 19 twice in February, which is his career high. And you see with both of these guys, the defense is absolutely there. Their steal numbers are very solid. They're not maybe out of the charts. They're not quite yet obviously like defensive all defensive team just yet, but I think that that is definitely the surface. I think that Amen Thompson can absolutely be around there. And Asar came out very hot on the rebounds, the steals, the blocks early in the year. So I still think these guys have very high ceilings, but the offensive efficiency has to get better. Both decently high turnover percentages, free throws aren't falling for them, both in the low 60s. So they're good defenders, they're hustle guys, but until we see that next level of scoring ability, I think that it is going to be a little bit of reservations. So on that note, we're going to start skipping around a little bit now that we are outside of the top five. Cason Wallace, the number 10 overall pick for OKC, I think has played his role very well. He comes off the bench for the most part for them, but he plays incredibly hard defense and he's shooting 44% on catch and shoot threes. So he is somebody that has a very strong upside in my opinion. And, you know, he came in into a team that, yes, young, but definitely had expectations that they were going to potentially be making the jump. And they have done so up to this point. And Wallace has found a way to be a contributing member of the team, which I like to see. Derek Lively, 
was the 12th overall pick. Talked about him and the Mavs a bunch as well. I think that he's a great fit as a roller and lob threat alongside both Luka and Kyrie. I also think that his defense has been a lot more mature than I was expecting coming into the year. And for a team that isn't very good on the defensive end, and the reason why I thought going into the year, I didn't think the Mavs were going to make the playoffs because I didn't think they were going to be able to get stops and they were going to be so reliant on this big guy. He has not been the weakest part of the defense. He's been a very solid defensive anchor. Now, when we get to the playoffs and he's going to have to go up against a Carl Anthony Towns or an Anthony Davis, I think things will be different. But I absolutely love how he's looked so far this year. Been dealing with injuries as of late but I think will definitely be a contributing player down the stretch of this year and should be down the uh, over the next course of the next few years for sure. Keontae George, I've been talking about a lot lately, I feel like, so I won't go on too long about him, but he was the 16th overall pick. He has been a ton of fun to watch. I just think that the scoring and playmaking ability from him I mean, when he gets hot, he takes over. And I think that he's a big-time spark plug for this Jazz team that is a little bit middling, not totally knowing where they are in all of this. I think that Danny Ainge, their GM, has just sort of been trying to maximize the value of every single player, every single asset that they have. And I think that they got a really good one in Keontae George, who... One of the younger guys in his class as well. Um, so I'm I'm a big fan of Keontae George. I've been talking about this for a bit. So I will leave it at that for there. Jaime Hawkes Jr., of course, one of the most talked about rookies in this class, was just in the dunk contest at All-Star Weekend. He was the 18th overall pick. Now, this was an NBA-ready guy had spent four years at UCLA, had been on some of those Final Four teams in really competitive environments, and it just seemed like it was a natural fit for him coming into the Miami Heat, where he was very ready to go. I just think the intelligence with him is so clearly there. He doesn't make a lot of those rookie mistakes. He's very... There's a lot of conviction with him when he is making decisions. He does what he's asked to, and he does so at a high pace. I really enjoy watching him play. As a Celtics fan, I get a little bit nervous because he seems like somebody that is set for a really big playoff series when that comes around. But I think that, again, this was just such a natural fit, him with the Miami Heat. It seems like the players around him really enjoy him as well. I think he's going to be a very, very solid player throughout the course of his NBA career. Definitely on pace to be all-rookie first team this year. Last couple guys here, Brandon Pajemski at number 19. We've talked about him a bunch as well, of course, and the way that he's been able to contribute. I mean, the fact that the Warriors were comfortable enough to, yes, Klay Thompson hasn't been great this year, but I don't think that he's been terrible. And the fact that they had the confidence to go in with Pajemski, start, put him in the starting lineup, and it sounds like that's going to be their plan for a good bit because he is an another one of these players that is just so smart. He is extremely active on defense, leads the NBA in charges drawn. He hits the shots when they need him to. He's a very good shooter, very solid passer, plays into this Warriors system very well in my opinion, and I have been definitely a fan watching him. I can't say I knew very much about him. Um, can't say I knew very much about him coming into the league, but I have been very happily surprised by him. And then the last guy on this list here is Cam Whitmore, who went number 20 to the Houston Rockets. This was one of the bigger stories on draft night because he was projected to go as high as four and he ends up falling to 20. You know, there was concerns with his injury at Villanova. There was a little bit of potential attitude stuff there, but I think he has been showing his flashes. He hasn't played a ton necessarily 
for the Rockets this season. Only 20 or so games. I'll pull it up right now. But he, you know, missed a lot of time this year. He was injured going into the All-Star break as well, which again is a little bit of a story with him based off of the way that his college career went. Played in 28 games, but he's averaging 12 points per game on 48-40 shooting splits. I think that there is definitely a lot of potential with this kid, and I am excited to see how this plays out because the Rockets are another one of those teams. I guess I fell off of them maybe a little bit um, as of late, but I think that they're another very fun watch for a young team. So I think that he can definitely play a significant role in their future. On that note, we are going to be taking our final break. And when we come back on the other side, I'm going to be giving my list of NFL teams that have the most pressure to win next season. So stick with us. We will be right back. <laughs> 